morning, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for attending our webinar series uh, on capital market development, China and Asia. Uh, so this web, uh, same, uh, webinar series uh, was launched by uh, ABFER and also Becker Friedman Institute of China, and also sponsored by uh, Five University and Institute, and they are uh, NUIs and Shanghai Advanced, uh, Advanced Institute of Finance, uh, Department of Economics, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and also Chinese University of Hong Kong Shenzhen, and the PBC uh, School of Finance, Tsinghua University. So we are very glad uh, to have everyone online and uh, at least the moment. So this is our 13th uh, seminar since the beginning of our a webinar series and we have the great speaker and the great discussant today. Uh, so first let me introduce uh, the speaker for today's webinar and uh, he's uh, Hong Jun Yan, a professor of finance and a chair and a director of Richard HD Center for Behavioral Finance and from the Department of Finance and Real Estate and the DuPont University. And, uh, uh, our discussant uh, is uh, Utpo Bhattacharya, and uh, he's a chair professor, Department of Finance uh, from HK uh, University of Science and Technology. And so according to our format, and we are going to give 20 minutes, 25 minutes to the presenter and 25 minutes to the discussant. So we will have uh, 20 minutes for Q&A. So later on over the, the presentation, so you can tap on your questions on, uh, on the Q&A session, okay? So let's, uh, let me um, turn the microphone to Professor Hong Yuan, and he will talk about uh, angry borrowers. I'm sure that you will not be angry and you will be happy about his presentation. Okay, welcome Hong Yuan. Great, thank you so much uh, for having me. So I always wanted to write a paper about angry birds. So this is the closest that I've ever uh, got to. So this paper is called Angry Borrowers. This is a joint paper with Liao Li, Zheng Wei, uh, and Song Yi at the Tsinghua University, and uh, Jun Yang from uh, the Indiana University. So they should be in the audience helping me to uh, uh, answer the questions. So <clears throat> let, let's dive right into it. Let's start with the thought experiment. So you're facing a choice between $20 and zero. So which one do you want? The answer seems obvious until I give you the context. It turns out what's happening is the following. Somebody offered $100 to you and another person, let's call him Mr. A. Somehow Mr. A thinks he deserves 80% of it, decides to keep $80 and gives you only $20. So you have two choices. You either say yes, in that case, you get $20 and let Mr. A to get four times as much. Alternatively, you can say no, in that case, you get zero, but that Mr. A is not gonna get anything either. So how do you feel about this? Once I tell you now you are facing the choice between zero and $20, and this picture may describe how you feel about it. And some of you may have recognized this is the famous ultimatum bargaining game. And it has been um, replicated over time across countries. The evidence is overwhelming that very often people pick zero over $20 just to penalize, retaliate the unfair treatment from your opponent. And this choice of zero over $20 is what people call negative reciprocity. Numerous uh, really well-known uh, economists some Nobel Prize winners, maybe a couple of uh, 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 economists will get Nobel Prize in the future. And they believe negative reciprocity phenomena played an important role behind a number of key issues in economics, from labor market bargaining to business cycle dynamics, uh, public goods uh, provision, contracting, uh, social norm, et cetera. But the literature so far has been primarily based on experimental evidence, presumably because of the difficulty of empirically measuring negative reciprocity. That is, 
onto our paper. We are hoping to directly measure negative reciprocity in a real financial market. The market we considered is called cash loan market in China. The market targets、uh, subprime borrowers. The loans are uncollateralized、uh, micro loans. So the median size of the loans we are analyzing is two hundred dollars. In twenty seventeen, there were over thirty million borrowers, and the aggregate outstanding amount is over a hundred billion RMB. Because the loans are targeting subprime borrowers and also is uncollateralized, the delinquency rate is fairly high, it's over forty percent, and the eventual default rate is over ten percent. As you can imagine, in such a business environment, debt collection is a critical part of the business model, and also it's pretty difficult to do、uh, to collect debt in such an environment. Litigation is not going to help because the loan size is so small. So. In the end, debt collectors came up with all kinds of creative ways of doing it. The one we are considering, the new tactic people introduced in 2015, is that if a borrower becomes delinquent, they're going to make phone calls to the borrowers. They're also going to call your family and friends, the key contacts of delinquent borrowers. And soon after this is introduced, there was a new Chinese term、uh, specifically designed to describe.、Uh, This tactic. So our paper、uh, tries to、um, analyze the consequence of such a collection tactic, and our estimate suggests that it seems like the strategy had backfired. The debt collection actually increased rather than decreased the default propensity. Our estimate suggests that the collection increased the default rate by six to fourteen percentage points, and. What's happening there is that this tactic angered, embarrassed the delinquent borrowers, and they decided to retaliate and made less effort to repay, even if they could have repaid. But now they are so angry, they decided not to do it. And we also analyzed the variations in the degree of the retaliation over time and across investors to shed further light on the underlying economic <clears throat> mechanism. So, for example. We identify、uh, uh, cases where we think the perception of unfairness is stronger, and the prior、uh, analysis based on experimental evidence suggests that the retaliation should be stronger there as well. That's indeed what we find. We also find that men tend to retaliate more than women, exactly as suggested by prior literature based on experimental evidence. Hong Jun, another Hong Jun, yes, Hong Jun, may I interrupt you? Um, yeah. Would you mind to just briefly describe this cash loan market institution? Oh, sure. I, I, I will, Because I, I'm I will not familiar a, with it. Absolutely. I have a couple of slides right after this to give you details, exact the details on this market. Thank you. So, sure. And the last one is about asset options.、Uh, prior experiments have shown that if、uh, somebody has a better、uh, asset option. Well, they are more capable of retaliating. They are going to retaliate more when they feel they are treated unfairly. So I will、uh, throw out more details on those uh, anal uh, analysis. And in end, we also considered a couple of alternative interpretations. I'll give you more details、uh, later. But uh, as um, Berna asked, we want more details about this market. So I'm going to spend the next couple of minutes describing this cash loan market. <clears throat> so. We obtained data from a leading cash loan lender. Our data covered、uh, a sample period between 2015 to 2017, and this is a uncollateralized loan. If you want to apply for a cash loan, what you do is first install an app、uh, on your cell phone. But by installing the app, you have to give permission to the lender to obtain information on your phone, which include their contacts. Your phone call record, etc., etc. Then you need to set up your account to provide your, say, ID number, and the lender will conduct credit evaluation based on. They will first verify your identity. They will go search your historical borrowing record, criminal record,、uh, public penalty record, etc., and also they may collect、uh, other information about your online behavior. And based on the information the lender gets. They will create a credit score. If your score is above a certain threshold, your loan will be approved. In fact, after the approval, the borrower will get a credit line, 
And in the future, when the borrower need, you can simply directly withdraw within the limit of your credit line. After withdrawing, then that will be become your uh, debt. And going forward, you're gonna pay monthly uh, payments. Uh, just let me know, Bernard, if you think you want more details about this market. I think this is perhaps enough for us to grasp what's happening in this analysis. And after the, the borrowers get into trouble and become delinquent, the uh, debt collectors will start working. And in October 2015, the new tactic was invented, calling family friends. And it is believed that uh, the, the lender out the lender we worked with was the one who invented this a new tactic. And um, so right after the due date, they will send text messages to the delinquent borrowers and make phone calls to them to remind them, hey, you are late in your payment. There's uh, gonna be a three day grace period. Please pay, uh, repay as much uh, as soon as you can. And because if you don't uh, repay everything on day four, we're gonna call your family and friends. Then on day four, the debt collectors will start making phone calls to their key contacts. The uh, important uh, question, if I may, Go ahead. Um, sure. who are the debt collectors? Are their tactics legal or, you know, their all yes. the data privacy, all kinds of things that right now- Yes, yes. Yeah, let me give you a brief answer. Uh, probably probably the, uh, it does not have a huge um, implication on our analysis. The debt collector in, our analysis, those are in-house debt collectors, but sometimes they could, they could in principle hire third-party debt collectors. And whether it's legal or not, I think it's kind of in a gray area, but I, I think it's hard to claim it's totally illegal because when the borrowers, they sign up, they actually give permit, well, kind of give, give permission to the lenders uh, to share the information with third party if necessary, but obviously nobody really read the long uh, agreement. So that's pretty much the status. So the important feature we explored in the paper is that there are simply too many delinquent uh, borrowers, at least during the sample period we looked at. The lender ended up working on only three quarters of the delinquent loans. One quarter of the loans, they simply left untouched because they didn't have enough manpower to handle at least during our sample period. So the lender has a clear preference for collecting better loans, the loans with the higher ex-ante uh, repayment propensities. So what's happening is the following. Every day, they would take all the delinquent loans, they use their internal um, algorithm to predict the expected payment repayment propensity and rank all the delinquent borrowers, and they come up with a list. Those on the top, those are the best loans. They have the highest propensity to pay. Those at the bottom, they have the lowest propensity to pay. Then they chop up the uh, list, distribute, uh, divide it into a roughly 200 uh, sublist, each sublist given to one deck in house debt collector. The sublists are comparable across all the debt collectors. And so each collector has a list. On top of the list are you have those loan, best loans with the highest uh, ex uh, expected propensity to repay, and those at the bottom are the worst. Then they instruct all the debt collectors to go out and making, uh, to make a phone calls to the uh, family and friends of the delinquent borrowers. They instruct them to work from the top and work their way down. And at the end of the day, when they stop working, and they, you will some, they will have some loans left unworked. So the goal of our paper is to estimate the treatment effect from debt collection. And as I mentioned on the previous slides, the lender has a very systematic approach in debt collection, it's not random. You can't directly compare worked loans and unworked loans. The worked loans are better, obviously they should have a lower uh, default rate. Uh, than the unworked loans. In other words, the selection effect is going to be overwhelming. They're going to dominate whatever the treatment effect uh, we're trying to measure. So what do you do? The identification strategy is going to be try, uh, based on trying to come up with a subsample in which the worked loans are comparable with unworked loans. 
So for example, for each debt collector, you know where it stopped, the collector stopped, you try to come, uh, collect the loans above and below. Those above worked, uh, are worked loans, those below are unworked loans that you put them together, maybe you can uh, achieve your identification. But the problem, the challenge for us is that we actually do not have the data on the rankings and we do not have the allocations across collectors either. So what I mean by that is the following. So each day we have all the loans and on top of the, well, there are a lot of loans are worked on and those have a lot of loans, uh, have a quarter of the loans are not uh, unworked. For those worked loans, we do not know which collectors, uh, which collector made the phone call, but we do have the timestamp. We know, say, James was called, at, uh, his uh, family friends were called at nine o'clock, Kate at nine ten, et cetera, et cetera. So based on this, we can tell that those on top probably are the best ones. They should have a higher uh, um, repayment propensity with or without uh, uh, treatment. And those called at the late afternoon, maybe in the evening should be the worst loans. And those at the bottom, unworked loans are really the worst. So in other words, the loans collected at the later time during the day should be more comparable to the unworked loans. So then our first identification strategy is simply have a cutoff time, let's say 4 p.m. After four o'clock, the, the post 4 p.m. worked loans should be more comparable to unworked loans. After all, they may be still slightly better than unworked loans um, um, exactly. So you still have a little bit of selection effect, but because we throw away so much of the uh, best loans, so the selection effect should be much, much smaller. So we can uh, hopefully measure the treatment effect. So if you're still worried about the selection bias, well, let's try five o'clock, six o'clock, seven, we try all the way to 10 o'clock. When you move the um, time threshold, to a later time of the day, you're gonna have the loans toward more toward the bottom of the list and if therefore more similar to unworked loans, therefore the selection effect will become smaller, smaller and smaller. So the selection bias will gradually disappear. The treatment effect will become the one being measured. Obviously when you cut it too thin, you have too few work loan left, you will increase your standard error. So that's our strategy number one. I'll, identification strategy number two is simply use the standard propensity score matching method for each unworked loans. We'll try to match with the worked loans. And if the match is good enough, we'll keep them. Then we create a matched sample and we can measure the treatment effects. So the estimated results are quite comparable across the two identification strategies. The results I'm gonna show you are based on the strategy number one with the uh, cutoff time. So, in order to measure the debt collection uh, effect on default, we're gonna run a probability regression, uh, a regress default on uh, a dummy variable, work i, which is one if long i is worked on and zero otherwise. And we start with a 4 p.m. Uh, cutoff time, create a match, create a, a subsample, then we run our regression, we get a beta estimate, which is a positive positively significant, suggesting that maybe the collection tax backfired. When you collect them, they actually uh, have a higher default rate. The implied marginal effect for debt collection is 5.9 percentage point, meaning when you collect, you actually increase the default rate by 5.9%. And now let's move down the uh, cutoff time for, from 4 p.m. to 5, 6, 7, all the way to 10. As expected, this is not, oh, here it's coming out. So when you postpone the cutoff time, the estimated treatment effect will be more and more clear. So the effect should be stronger and stronger. Exactly as expected, the beta coefficient becomes bigger when you, the cutoff time is uh, later and the implied marginal effect is gonna be larger. And for example, for the case with 10 p.m. Um, cutoff time, the implied marginal effect is a 14.3 percentage point. By collecting, you increase the default rate by 14.3 percentage points. So as a comparison, the default rate for unworked loans 
is 60%. Uh, so the impact is pretty significant. It's a 10 percentage, a 10 percent increase. So our interpretation is that those delinquent borrowers really got angry and they are so embarrassed and angered. So they decided not to make effort to, to repay. And as a result, default rate actually increased. So to uh, put more weight onto this interpretation, we exploit the uh, variations over time and across uh, borrowers. So the first one we considered is really the core of the concept of negative reciprocity. It's really the perception of unfairness, right? Why do you retaliate in the automated bargaining game? Because you think the other person is not being fair. And prior evidence also suggested very clearly that if you more if you are more pissed off, you are going to retaliate more. So that's exactly what we are going after. So how do we do that? Well, when are you going to be angry? Well, when things happen and not matching your expectation, when it is a negative surprise, and this actually has becoming a, a standard modeling device in theoretical analysis. And for example, re, re, there is a recent QJE paper um, uh, exactly used uh, this idea that a negative surprise causes anger. And anybody with experience in dealing with the kids know exactly what I'm talking about, right? If kids didn't get what they want, that's exactly when they get ang uh, angry. So what we do here is to notice, uh, uh, we notice a very important fact here is at the beginning in October, 2015, when this um, tactic was introduced, People didn't know what's going on. And they, they, they sign up the agreement, but they are not expecting family and friends being harassed. When that happened, they got really angry. So the retaliation is expected to be stronger. But by mid 2016, this is widely reported. In the first half of the sample, probably you can say that this tactic is more hushed up. People do not know that, uh, that uh, do not have the expectation of being harassed, uh, their family, friends being harassed. At the later part, the, the, the expectation shifted, the anger probably will be smaller. And if you split out sample, do the analysis, you see that in your first half of the sample, the retaliation is very strong. Second half, the, the effect disappeared. Exactly as the interpretation suggested. The second one is about gender difference. Then you'll have a five minutes. Okay. Thank you. So we know women are, so in general, less uh, reciprocal and they should retaliate less. And there are also some other evidence based on testosterone level and also in the um, uh, automaton bargaining game comparing male and female that they find male generally retaliate more. So we did the regression with interaction term and I'm, gonna, I'm just showing you this plot, uh, this figure here, showing you the uh, implied the marginal effect for uh, retaliation for male and female. For the male subsample, the retaliation is about 13%. It's uh, very statistically significant. For female, it's insignificant. Another one is about outside option. Um, prior um, evidence suggests that when you have better outside option, you are more capable, capable of retaliate, you're gonna retaliate more. And we find that in our sample, those with a better credit rating, like rated as A and B by the vendor, they retaliate more, the implied uh, marginal effect is uh, statistically significant and lower when those, those with a lower rate rating, they are less retired. So by now, probably some of you already come up with some alternative interpretations. Let me quickly go through two. The first one is nothing to lose, right? Example, you know your, your, your family and friends are gonna be harassed, you're gonna try to make effort to repay. But after the fact, after they are being harassed, there's nothing more to lose then, okay, I'm not gonna, the ex ante effect is gonna be negated. I'm not gonna make effort to pay. As a result, the ex ante effect create the appearance of retaliation. But this alternative interpretation also implies that when the ex ante effect is stronger, the appearance of retaliation should be stronger as well. Maybe this effect played some role in our result, but it's certainly not consistent with our overall evidence. For example, the ex ante effect we know clearly is stronger for women. There's overwhelming evidence on that. And the alternative interpretation implies that the women should have a stronger appearance of retaliation, but we, don't, we didn't find that. We find exactly the opposite. Similarly, in the second half of our sample, the ex ante effect should be stronger. 
uh, the appearance of retaliation should be stronger based on this alternative interpretation, we find exactly the opposite. Another alternative interpretation that if you collect, call the, harass their family and friends, maybe this person no longer has family and friends to help him, it's going to have trouble borrowing to repay their debt, they're going to default, right? So basically damage the reputation effect. But this hypothesis also implies that, well, the damage reputation effect should also imply that it's going to have harder time to consume, maintain the consumption level. So why don't we check the consumption level? We obtain the uh, online spending data and of those delinquent borrowers. Our data is powerful enough to detect the decline in consumption uh, before delinquency, but we cannot find any extra decline in the worked borrowers. So now let me conclude. So our paper, we think, is the first one to uh, empirically document the negative reciprocity in a financial market. We actually think it's a tip of an iceberg. It's not confined to China or emerging economy. For example, a recent article of uh, Washington Post described exactly the same story. Some debt collector using LinkedIn page to find the former uh, boss and family members of a delinquent borrower and harass them. So exactly the same thing happening uh, in the US. We just don't have enough data to document. The other one is actually the phenomenon is not confined to debt collection either. And for exp example, we know that foreclosure destroys for, uh, home value. Uh, a recent estimate suggests destroys the, the value loss is 27%. But a part of the loss in home value is perhaps due to the vandalism by previous owners. For example, this recent uh, picture by CNN shows that clearly the prior owner made their feelings clear to everyone by ripping off the, the wall. And this suggests that the negative reciprocity in this context probably has a lot of important implications on the value of house, mortgage, mortgage-backed securities, and also optimal policy responses to the housing crisis. So let me just stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Hong Jun. You control the time very well. And uh, let's invite Professor Wutbo Bhattacharya to give the discussion. And uh, Wutbo. Okay, hello everyone. This is a really fun paper. Angry borrowers inspired by angry birds. And it is being discussed by a very happy discussant, Wutbo Bhattacharya. So we need a counterbalancing. So I'll follow the same thing that I've been following for the last 31 years, uh, refereeing, critiquing, discussing papers, which is when I went into the job market and then was given my first paper to a referee, I had no idea. So I asked the editor, what should I do? And he said, first find out what this paper is trying to do. This paper asks whether a particular type of social sharing targeting a delinquent borrower's social circle and telling this person's friends, your friend is a bad person, can't pay debts, is an effective debt collection technique. That's it. And it is a very clear answer. This is not effective. Why not? It backfires. Borrowers become angry and they refuse to pay. So the four questions that the editor wanted me to ask is, is the research question important? It must be. It links two big topics and both of them are very close to my heart. One is debt. Last time I checked, there were about 28,000 plus downloads in SSRN. And the second is China, the world's most populous country and has 29,495 downloads in SSRN. And for those who know a little about me, I've been in mainland, this part of China, greater China, for the last seven years, leaving my family because I'm fa very fascinated with this part of China. But let me go back to my guru, William Shakespeare. What did he say? Neither a borrower nor a lender be. So that's Polonius talking to his son in Hamlet and Shakespeare. The second question that we should ask after it's an important question is, is the results novel? Is there something that's unique about this? Or is it just the same old stuff as is usually happening these days? It is very novel. As a matter of fact, much too novel. Why? Because whenever there's debt delinquency, I'm not referring to the lit finance literature, that's boring. 
history, literature, popular culture, current affairs have given us tales of angry lenders. I've never heard stories of angry borrowers. So here are some stories of angry lenders. So this is a picture of a broken bench. Now, you may wonder why I'm showing you a broken bench. Well, the word bankruptcy is set to stem from an Italian tradition of destroying the workbench of a tradesman who couldn't pay his debts. So angry creator comes and destroys this guy's bench. The Italian phrase for broken bench, bancarotta, is the origin of the word bankruptcy. Okay, now I'm going to, to, to show you snippets from two movies. First, from the West. And then you may say, oh, I am biased towards the West. Well, no, not really. The viral Netflix show, Squid Game, something from the East as well, two minutes each. And let me warn the people who may not want to watch this, these are violent. And of course, the classic case of angry lenders is the very sad case of bonded labor, which has been there for centuries and still exists in countries like my country, India. What is bonded labor? The, the person who's in debt can't pay. So then his son has to pay, and then his son has to pay, and then his son has to pay. So the entire generation is bonded to the creditor. And for those of you interested, there's a great book, which I've given a link to, to look at that. So let's look at snippets of these movies to tell you how angry creditors can become. Let me know when you can hear, if you can hear the volume. Take it outside. What are you getting in the body? I gotta tell you something, pal. You still got it. You got every move. Though you were dead. Oh, sorry, like right, Frenchie, believe me. Story for another time. Dude, those three picks for him around. What do you say? Are you serious? Yeah, really? Yeah. What is this? It's called a car, mate. No, it's a wheelchair with a roof, Frenchie. It's clean, it's quiet, and it doesn't smell like your ass on the inside. All right. Let me off to you first, then. Las Vegas. Is that okay with you? Pardon me. Does the English shoe salesman know who he's talking to? No, it's pussy for around, so you've already prepared the readies. Let's have it. Give the bag to Mr. French. What's your problem? She gave it a word to visit the French okay? <laughs> Too much violence there. So let's go to something from the East. Okay, so those were stories of very, very angry creditors from the East as well as the West. Well, as I said, let's do China. And this I've been researching to get official documentation. So there are stories about lock victims up, intimidate, intimidate them until the loan is paid. There are yin and contracts, one legal, one illegal, to hide illegal loan agreements. Use auto redial to intimidate victims and friends and families until loan is repaid. 
but this takes the cake. Target mainly students and females. These loans require borrowers to send nude pictures as collateral, which will be used for subsequent debt collection process. And I'm not inventing this. This is actual documentation. And here I have a picture of this. This is not from some anti-China press. This is from Global Times, the official organ. Police display other weapons seized from debt collectors. So this is what's happening. So these are angry predators. But the entire world has a more nuanced view of lenders versus borrowers. So let me go back to my Shakespeare. And this is Merchant of Venice. And the debt is a contract. And this person can't pay, pound of flesh is owed. So the judge says, a pound of this person's flesh is yours. The court awards it and the law authorizes it. And the creator says, what a righteous judge. Portia says, and you have to cut this flesh from this chest. The law allows it and the court awards it because it's in the contract. Shylock says, what a wise judge. Come on, get ready. And then Portia comes back to the party. But wait a moment. There's something else. This contract doesn't give you any blood at all. The words expressly specify a pound of flesh. So take your penalty of a pound of flesh, but if you shed one drop of Christian blood when you cut it, the state of Venice will confiscate your land and property. So modern finance is very nuanced. Debt contracts with explicit rules for lenders and borrowers, possibility of debt renegotiation, ex ante suboptimal but ex post optimal, ex ante optimal but ex post sub suboptimal, debt overhang, debt this, debt that. It's a very, very nuanced view of this fight between the lenders and the borrowers. But angry borrowers? Only in China. And that's why I live here. Debt with Chinese characteristics. So the second question for the reference, third question is the execution competence. Empirics have some serious issues in interpreting the results. And the theory, Issues even if the empirical results are correctly interpreted. So let's look at these empirical research design. And I was trained as a theorist, but I've learned all my empirical work from the great empiricists at HKUSD. So there's a table, panel D, shows that in the entire sample, default rate of work loans, and what are work loans? Work loans are loans where you have called these guys friends, and that's why you're making him angry are lower than the default rates, rates of unworked loans where friends are not informed. And the second fact, which is shown in table two, that default increases as the time of day increases. So let me put these facts together and let me draw for you a very simple graph, which is there's a proprietary algorithm which sends a list to all debt collectors. And suppose you start your day at 9 a.m. and end it at 11 p.m. Let me take my laser pointer. And this is the default probability. So the better loans are worked out in the morning and then you work throughout the day. And you may get the guys to send you back your money in which you get a commission. So this is your working morning. Suppose you work till 4 p.m. and you say, oh, I'm too tired. I want to get up right now. So after that, these are unworked loans. These are worked loans for a guy. Note from this figure that the morning loans are better, the afternoon loans are worse in terms of default probability, at least the excited default probability because there's a proprietary algorithm. So that's the top of the list and it's the bottom of the list and it's incentive compatible. Okay, so what would I do as a good empiricist? I say, you know, I'm comparing apples and oranges. So let's do, if I could, a regression discontinued design around a particular agent. So let's assume her stopping time is 10.30 p.m. She goes home at 10.30 p.m. And let's look at these things around here. So they are very similar. This is worked. This is unworked. And let's compare the worked and un unworked. Fantastic research design. Problem is you can't do that, at least in this paper, because they don't have this data per agent. So they have an aggregate. So what's your proxy? They say, let's take a cutoff time at 10 p.m. And let's look at loans after that. So what's a problem? Advantages and advantages. So here, this is quite small. Compare worked and unworked loans with stopping times after 10 p.m. This is good for RDD. However, notice all the worked loans that are here are not in the sample. 
but all the unworked loans are in the sand. So there's a bad bias against work. So cutoff time has this problem of 10 p.m. So if you use a cutoff time at 4 p.m., which is what this paper does, now you're here, you look at these ones. What happens here? The second is not so bad, but now it's apples and oranges. You're no longer using RDD. Worked at unworked loans with stopping times after 4 p.m. for RDD. So this is the main table and the main result. These are the coefficients. And if these are positive, the work loans are higher default, which means these guys are angry. And all of these are positive. This is the 4 p.m. one, and this is the 10 p.m. one. Positive, they conclude tactic backfires, borrowers default more if their friends are caught. Put my green things again, there are these trade-offs, pluses and minuses in each other. So what's my discussion? The issue with RDD is that it's only locally correct. It's usually not a problem because generalization to a larger sample is not too controversial. Unfortunately for the authors, in the context of this research design, using cutoff time as a proxy for RDD, this generalization doesn't work. Why is that? As we saw, later cutoff time is good for RDD, but bad for bias, whereas earlier cutoff time is bad for RDD, but not so bad for bias. Both are bad choices. So I like to give constructive commentary. So what do we do? Sorry, I can't think of anything. Junk this research design, it just does not work. Okay, let me give the authors the benefit of the doubt. Suppose this research design does work and they don't, don't agree with me. But then we have other problems. What are the problems? Look at this table very carefully. Notice all the coefficients are positive. But notice the coefficients decrease as cutoff time as early in the day. So this is very positive, less positive, less positive, less positive. All the coefficients are decreasing. If you look at fact one, at 9 p.m., the coefficient is actually negative because the default rates of workloads are lower than the default rates of one, one workloads. So if I've taken high school algebra and all of this is decreasing and somewhere out here, there's a minus number. So then is a turning point here. This implies that there exists a cutoff time where the coefficient turns from positive to negative. Suppose that is 3 p.m. This implies that borrowers are angry only after 3 p.m. Oops. So even if this research design is correct, so the only claim that can be made is that borrowers become angry only after 3 p.m. if their friends are called. Why? I have no idea. But that is another paper, not this one. This new paper will have to resolve some contradictions, assuming the research design is correct. Example, the old paper says that people with outside options are more angry because you have outside options, very intuitive. But this new paper, it's people after 3 p.m. who are angry. And according to the algorithm, people after 3 p.m. actually have less outside options. So I give up. You have to junk this research design. Unless you have data per agent, then of course you're home free. But unless you have that, you can't do this. So you go to the next one, which is the old workhorse, propensity score matching. So match each unworked loan with work loans which have the same propensity to be worked on. Perfectly logical and legible. And here's the main result in its interpretation. The work loans means their friends are called, it's positive, they get very angry. Again, you see tactic backfires, borrowers default more, their friends are called. Discussion. Uh, uh, dark side. Unfortunately for the authors, in the context of this research, the use of PS, PSM has a peculiar paradox. What is that? Recall that the lender has developed a proprietary algorithm to forecast retailing propensity, and borrowers are being ranked accordingly. And they've been given a time of day. So this implies that a work loan and unworked loan around the same stopping time has the same propensity to be worked. As a matter of fact, this was the logic behind the original idea, RDD. Given that the propriety algorithm is likely to be more accurate than the author's own algorithm, why? Not because those guys are smarter, but these guys are more private information, as well as programmers who are paid to develop efficient algorithms. 
this proprietary algorithm should be used by the authors. Of course, it can't be. So the authors use their own code. They match each unworked loan with four work loans. But again, we have a problem. The work loans have timestamps, but the unworked loan does not. It is possible that we are comparing the first unworked loan of an agent who stopped working at 3 p.m., say at 3.01 p.m., with a, and who's a borrower with a lower propensity default, with four work loans after 9 p.m., and these are borrowers with high propensity default. So that's a big bias. And I can't correct for this bias because I don't have the time step of the unworked loan. We cannot tell. So big problems with the empirics. What about the theory? Now I'm a theorist. This is what I think I can say a little more. The authors pitch their paper as an example of negative reciprocity, but is it really? So negative reciprocity occurs when person B negatively affects person A after person A has negatively affected person B. And what makes it interesting is best, is sometimes, though not always, it's not in the person best interest to retaliate. So here, let me give you an example. I have been invited to 11 provinces in mainland China, and I've been to all the top schools except Say. Jun Pan has never invited me to Say. Now, suppose Jun Pan, after listening to this, says, okay, Utpal, you can come. I say, no, thank you. Negative reciprocity. And it's against my interest to say no thank you. So that is real negative reciprocity. Most of these situations occur in one-shot games. What makes it interesting is that the literature has documented sometimes occur in multiple year games. Most of these situations occur between people who are not linked by formal contracts, arms length. However, there are instances of reciprocity, both positive and negative, occur between people linked by formal contracts. And the authors are a very good example of that. Suppose you treat a person well, so these guys work harder for you. Positive reciprocity and vice versa. A word about five minutes. Yeah. So what is different here? Debt is very different. As a matter of fact, the debt contract is a formal contract where negative reciprocity is explicit in the contract. It's not unexpected. If borrower is delinquent, lender does something bad to the borrower. And sometimes the borrower is delinquent, the lender does something bad, and the borrower does default. Is this negative reciprocity? Or is it rational? Borrower had no other option. Or is it strategic default? Or is the borrower behavior unexpected and off equilibrium? If so, do we settle down later to a stable equilibrium? I'm partial to the alternative hypothesis because of Bo Yu Jiang's paper. So in this paper that I'm discussing, this effect, the angry guys appear in October 2015 to August 26. But in the second half of the sample, they don't seem to be angry anymore. Why is it? Is it because their friends are not being called or they have got used to the fact? I don't know. As a matter of fact, in Bohu's paper with the school authors, we have the stable equilibrium in July 27 to now, to now on. So if my alternative hypothesis is correct, the questions are far more interesting. First, how far will social shaming proceed before the equilibrium becomes unstable? That's a positive question. Normative question, in the Chinese society, how far will social shaming be allowed to proceed? And the broad schemes of creditor versus debtors, how much should limited be in limited liability? So these are deep questions. Angry borrowers is fun, angry birds is fun, but serious theorists should write serious theory papers. Other question, is there clarity in presentation? So some major problems. So the beginning is a little superficial. The explanation of negative reciprocity and its link to debt default should be improved. Gender is fashionable these days. I'm a paper with gender. But remember, we have to think a little about gender. It is true that men have higher testosterone, but women value privacy more. It's not clear who should get angrier. And this point I mentioned before, it's true that borrowers with outside options should get more angry. But the ones who get angry, assuming the author's research design is correct, are the ones with fewer outside options, because these are the 3 p.m. guys and later. Then they have another very interesting result, which is reduced ability to borrow from social contracts will affect consumption. 
in these days we get angry. But it will only be affected if the consumption is funded by borrowings from your friends. We don't know that. And then something minor, which is a little annoying. The authors keep saying small dollar loans. I thought in China it should be small renminbi loans. Okay. Bohu is telling me time to go. So let me show you Superman. And what does Superman says? With great power comes great responsibility. Similarly, with big claims come big burdens of proof. So to conclude, reject, rethink, reposition, resubmit. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Wutbo. Uh, before uh, Hongjun retaliate, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Hongjun to retaliate the chance. So, uh, uh, can I also ask one question? Uh, yeah, sure. The general ability. So Hongjun shows that indeed, and in this sample, and then once you 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 try to impose this debt collection tactics on a group of borrowers, and then it will trigger an increase in this default rate. So I'm wondering, there could be some uh, uh, large heterogeneity uh, across these uh, micro loan companies, uh, especially before 2017 and 2018. And these micro loan companies and then these uh, debt collectors may not be well trained. So in that case, when they use their own language tactics in Chinese called Hua Shu, loan techniques, and then to collect loans, it may trigger some angers. So in later years, for example, after 2017, and also China imposed uh, this regulation in protecting uh, borrowers, borrowers, to some extent, they are not going to face violence in that collection. So in that case, maybe such uh, violent uh, debt collection technique will not be so detrimental. Uh, I'm not sure whether I express my, my question clearly. Yeah, you are saying that debt collectors are more polite not in the later polite, years, right? not, uh, in some way, yeah. yeah. That is one possibility. Uh, I think the expectation clearly might play an important role as well. So since Woodpaw has such a uh, long, eloquent uh, discussion, I just want to have a, a, a quick response, then we get to questioning that, okay? Okay, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, clearly, the, from all the discussions that I ever had with Woodpaw in the past, I have heard so many comments and discussions. I almost always agree with all of the comments. And um, uh, for today, actually, some of the uh, points I, I think are really brilliant. Uh, but I have to say some of the comments, I, I happen to be on exactly the opposite side. So let, let me just very briefly explain why I think um, the, the opposite side of Woodport's opinion can potentially be correct here. So um, the first one, I think the most important one for this paper is really about the identification. It's not that when you run regression, you get a positive coefficient, all of a sudden there's angry. When you get a negative, there's no angry. It, it, it's really about when you make the worked loans and unworked loans more comparable, then you see a positive coefficient. That is a clear evidence of the borrowers being angry. But we know the overall worked loans, some of them are very good, it's not comparable, but when you cut the sample by moving the cutoff time to a later and later time, you gradually make the sample closer and closer to the unworked loans. And so what you should expect is that suppose we don't treat any uh, uh, loans, you should see an increasing line in the default uh, rate. But after you treat some of them, instead of uh, say straight line going up, now you see line uh, jumping up, then coming back down. At a later time of the day, the lower ranked loans actually have a lower default rate. And that's a clear sign of retaliation. So uh, for any empirical estimation, you cannot say uh, we have clearly identified this single effect. 
we know the estimate, uh, our estimate will be contaminated by the selection effect. If you don't do anything, the contamination is so overwhelming, we get a, a negative sign. When the contamination is more and more cleaned out, they eventually we switch sign and get a larger and larger effect. So that's the first one I want to say. Um, so when, uh, I wrote down a few, so may, maybe just make two more quick comments, then we open to questions. I think those comments are, are really, really important for us to try to uh, do a better job uh, addressing. So for example, the comment about why not angry in the second half? So um, let, let me tell you one, one, one story. So in, in, in daycare, when they want kids to follow some um, uh, instructions, the, the, the number one thing they learned from psychologists is really you need to set up a very clear expectation. If you don't set up the expectation right, you will make the kid very angry. For example, if you want kids to stop playing, you cannot simply say, hey, 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 it's time to stop playing. All the kids will start screaming and crying. So what do you do? You give them expectation, say, hey, five more minutes, then we all clean it up. They, they do that by playing a guitar and a sing to the kids. And the kids know now they have the expectation, oh, okay, I need to stop in five minutes. Then when I have to stop, maybe I'm a little unhappy, but I'm not sweet, be screaming. And perhaps a similar phenomenon happened to those uh, angry borrowers. Well, I know what I got into in the second half. After mid-2016, after so many high-profile stories, I know what I got into. So I thought I would not be delinquent, but unfortunately I am. Yeah, they are gonna call my friends uh, that for me, but perhaps I, I, I will be less angry as a result. So that is really uh, the, the one, um, uh, one point I want to uh, come across. And in fact, this idea has been so well accepted, not only by psychologists, but also uh, economists. Um, uh, somehow a Nobel Prize winner's name sl slipped my mind uh, at this point. Uh, I, he recently had a paper where he explicitly used this um, uh, um, difference between the realization and expectation as, um, as, as a measure for being angry. Uh, if it didn't happen uh, to know, to remember the name of the author, let me know. He's, he's a Nobel Prize winner, How can, uh, Oliver Hart, sorry. Um, uh, serious, uh, serious theorists are really considering this kind of phenomena uh, seriously as well. In fact, this phenomenon is, phenomena is uh, retard, um, Reciprocity is considered so fundamental, and some sociologists believe this played a critical role for human evolution. Um, yeah, let, let me just stop here. Uh, I will make that, make sure we go through all the um, comments. Make sure we will try our best uh, to to address them. Uh, but I'm pretty sure we will get back to Woodpaw uh, to discuss those points. Uh, will you can this happy discuss and respond? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Can I respond? So, go ahead. Uh, if, if, One if you need to, I, I, yeah. I fully agree with your second point, which is that uh, the daycare example is very nice. But but there is another interpretation, which is previously it was off equilibrium. Now it's become a stable equilibrium. So that's the interpretation that I'm trying to do, which is sticking to the conventional thing and not going to sexy things like negative reciprocity. I'm a conservative. So I like to mm. stick to off equilibrium to stable equilibrium. But by your uh, first point, I disagree. Remember, I'm not saying that the, we have to look at the coefficient. We have to look at the coefficient yeah. around the RD, around the local thing. And the coefficient mm. around the local will be very different from the general. I agree with that. But you're not doing the local. After 4 p.m. to 10 p.m., it's apples and oranges comparisons. Yeah, local is not a religion. Local is not a religion. The local can be this wide, can be this wide, right? So when you narrow the bandwidth, your estimation is supposed to be more um, purely about the selection effect, uh, sorry, more purely about the treatment effect, but you're gonna sacrifice uh, the, the, uh, in the standard error. So there's always a trade-off. We, we shouldn't yeah, take it too, too literally. Okay, I, I think uh, we, we have several questions. And mm -hmm. then in that case, uh, 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 Bogui, can I? Uh, June, you you have a question? Yes. Oh yeah. Are Please. you gonna invite Wolfpaw to give a seminar? <laughs> I'm tempted to test that uh, recipe. I'm tempted to test uh, Wolfpaw uh, on that uh, angry recipe. Pro, pro, 
difficult to word for me to pronounce. But Uwe, it was not uh, Superman. It was actually the Spider-Man who says, Spider with great sorry. power comes great responsibility. Um, you would have another error in today's say, discussion. Uh, safe um, seminar list. So, so don't target me, target the safe. Um, Hongjui, I have an uh, interesting paper. I have a question. In China, you know, people actually don't pick up the phone. So I yeah. wonder how much of that measure is. So do you have a record of the attempt to call instead of just the, the success uh, mm. call, uh, phone calls? Uh, yes, uh, uh, my quarters may uh, correct me if I uh, get this wrong. Uh, I think the record shows that the um, uh, the phone call actually uh, went through, and they had okay. a conversation with the uh, family and friends. But how many um, times did they uh, did they try to call that person before it went through? Did they make uh, that? I, I, right, right. I'm I'm not sure we have this information. Right. That's my recollection. Uh, so I wonder how much of the and they are calling the friend of the debt of the borrower. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So I wonder how much is. I don't know if this inform this is informative, but it is also a measure of willingness to pick up the call by that friend, mm. and uh, the time of the day mm. is also interesting. I, I also notice that pattern, and I just like Upa, I also infer uh, the, the the when did it become negative. So the three p.m. I, I wonder if. It's really a measure of uh, the ranking of these followers versus the willingness to pick up the call during the day versus during the night. And I don't know if, if, if that's informative, what kind of information is embedded in it. Suppose the hypothesis is really just the willingness to call. And after 2017, yeah. maybe people don't pick up the call anymore. I, Maybe uh, there is these- uh, Those who picked up should have a higher propensity to repay according to this hypothesis. Or we find the opposite. Not necessarily. Um, hmm. maybe or maybe those who picked up are not willing to- more. Uh, What's that? Sorry, maybe I missed- Maybe to pick up the call is, is somehow in a- Negative in a correlate? Attention and, um, and, and intention to, to communicate with the data. Yes, but, and but these are the friends of the borrower, so I'm not so sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Those people they are yeah. key contacts. Key contacts mm -hmm. mean their relatives and also friends and also others. Could be co-workers as well. Uh, those yeah. who um, talk to them frequently. So it, it's really difficult. Probably will not transmit into the default decision through this channel, but yeah, I can't rule it out uh, uh, right away. Uh, another one, let me quickly uh, say that um, I don't think there's a magic at exactly a certain point in time where the coefficient becomes zero. Rather, I think it's gradually the, 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 the loans get worse and the selection effect gets smaller and smaller, eventually the dominated. Magnitude, the magnitude after 10 p.m. was a much larger magnitude, and I was... And I was looking at the, the sample size mm. as well. It it's very like small. A large, a large fraction actually occur after 10 p.m. If my numbers are right, after 4 p.m. So, yeah. it's about 1400. Then after 10 p.m. Yes. it becomes 800. So if you oh, split the oh. time, no? I see, let, let, let me clarify. So the oh. total sample size is 800, 700 of them oh. are unworked. Oh. Maybe even more. So I think the very few around seven hundred. That's why around seven hundred. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want to cut it too thin, but we just report everything we have done, uh, just to show that there's a clear pattern, the gradual change. That's why I'm not too worried about the the this, um, coefficient switched uh, sign, and uh, it seems uh, to us that it's really two forces are going on: the selection effect pushing it down treatment effect is pushing it out there. And when you cut this selection effect, eventually the coefficient will become positive. So Hongju, can I show uh, maybe two figures really quickly? Sure. So you, you said yeah. it in language, but if I show the figures, yeah. it's probably um, much easier. Um, do you see my screen? So this is essentially um, by time. 
we're looking at fraction of new borrowers uh, based on many research, new borrowers tend to more likely to default. And as you can see, the, uh, the trend is going up. The, 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 the loans caught later on are more likely to have uh, to be uh, new borrowers and it's peaked at um, 10 p.m. So uh, the one after that is the unworked loans. So essentially, if you compare those loans that were not caught, they are, they are probably a little bit better than the uh, 10 p.m. one, but they're a bit worse than 9 p.m. one, because this is where um, the selection effect is, is the minimum, and then we can really nail down the treatment effect. So very similar if I show you uh, how many payments are they made relative to the total payments, when you go uh, towards the later time of the day, these loans called have a smaller fraction of repayment. So a smaller fraction of repayment, these are the loans uh, more likely to default, right? So you see a clear trend going downwards and the unworked loans are somewhere between 9 p.m. and 10 p.m. So essentially what we characterize, what we capture is the reversal. The trend would predict it's going to go down further because if you do collection, that'll be even later, right? but we see the reversal right here. And the last one is default. It's very much the similar pattern. If you go with the calling time, the default rate goes up gradually and at uh, 10 p.m. is picked. But for the work uh, unworked loans, these are the ones you didn't call. You believe these are even, you know, it's not worth your time to call, right? And for the default rate, you don't see a uptrend, upward trending anymore. Again, these are somewhere between 9 p.m. and 10 p.m. in terms of the default rate, but if you base on the trending of the calling time, you should have a much higher uh, default rate. So this is how we, when we post that, when you zoom this one in, we do have a local treatment effect. So the only downside is now we have about a little bit over a hundred loans to the left, which are but, in the last two hours. But, but the, you, yeah. You can't have a local treatment back because the thing is, suppose let's compare you and me. You're a terrific person. You get up at six in the morning and you go to sleep at 5 p.m. I'm a horrible person. I start my day at 2 p.m. and go to sleep at midnight. So my 3 p.m. is very different from your 3 p.m. That's totally fine. But on average, on average, as long as you work what starting from you the morning. Can't do this unless you control for the agent. So you need that data for the agent. We are relying on the average effect. I'm showing you the trend, which shows you exactly the average effect. You can give us outliers or examples, but the average if I shows the trend is going that way and we are relying on it. We acknowledge the identification is not perfect, but the trend gives us some confidence. We're not doing something super crazy. Can, can you shed light on the preference function of the debt collectors? How do they, which one do they call early? Which one do they call late? I mean, without yeah. that piece of information, it's very hard to, to fully understand the, the, the discussions from left and right? Yeah, this is a very important question. Uh, in fact, I don't think we can completely resolve this question, but let me give you a few points that I think that will help for our understanding. First of all, it is not clear what the optimal strategy should be, right? Mm -hmm. So should you go for the uh, loans with the uh, highest propensity or lowest propensity? It's not clear. In fact, by talking to the uh, management, and they just took it for granted. It's almost obvious to them. Of course, we should go ahead and, and collect the loans with the highest propensity. But if, if you are talking to, uh, uh, say, a, a theorist, they will say, no, you want to go for the largest treatment effect, right? You should rank the largest treatment effect, uh, rank people by treatment effect. You treat the ones where you expect a treatment effect to be the largest, but apparently that's not what they are but, thinking. But do they, do they know what the impact of the treatment effect is? No, apparently. And also like, depending, it depends on the time of the day. You call me 6 a.m. versus you call me in the middle mm -hmm. of the day, they are very different. 6 a.m. is a harassment, but 3 p.m. is normal. I mean, there are a lot of questions of this sort that if we don't sort it out, it is not straightforward to interpret the results. Um, Right, so for and, so and then the I, overall I wonder, effect, I, go ahead. Let, let I also want to raise another, which is really institutional question. Okay. I understand that there's multiple periods. At the beginning, the debt collectors are using tactics that the public 
that's not welcome. And the government makes changes. And so we set to into another way. And so that matters a lot about whether things are within or not within expectations. And also the issue about settling into an equilibrium. Would you mind to shed light on that for, for me, who is not in China, and I just don't know too much about these changes? Okay. Um, okay, let, let's talk about the last one first, just in case I may forget. So uh, we're hoping to say that in the later half of the sample, people are more used to this rough treatment. The anger appears to be less of, of well, the treatment appears um, less of a surprise. And they know when they sign up, they know they expect to be harassed, but somehow they don't think they, uh, probably they think they will not be harassed. The friend, family friends will not be harassed. That's it. And but in the case when they do face the debt collection and they will be less angry. So that, that's all we hope to say here when you compare first and second but, half. But then in the two halves, the way yeah. you grant loan is endogenous, it's not exogenous. You cannot see sure. the two samples the same. Uh, do you have any specific endogenous um, uh, uh, Long approval uh, mechanism that affects the result. For for example, if I know what is permissible, what is not permissible, and how the market react, whereas that I do not know how the market react, and I think they're just beating other people up by mm. by phone harassment, then yeah. I can I can or cannot. I mean, so it's a very complicated game here. And uh, absolutely. Based on, so based on all this, I will select whom I'm going to lend money to. Uh, totally. So if you are trying to write down a simplified uh, model to analyze the whole thing, you, are, you quickly realize the, 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 the situation seems to be really complicated. I think you are exactly on the right track. I, I totally agree with your assessment. And in fact, by talking to the management, they, they thought they did a good job in their collection. They thought they increased the payment. And they were surprised to see a result that they worked loans actually appear to have um, uh, lower repayment uh, rate. Uh, but having said that, it's not clear whether they are hurting their profitability because the overall profitability should be evaluated differently because there may be some ex ante effect, which is not our focus. We didn't even analyze the ex ante effect. We don't have the data to analyze. So for example, when people heard about this potential treatment, they would avoid uh, being delinquent in the first place. And it, you really need a different data set to evaluate that. So from the firm's, uh, the lender's perspective, whether they did the right thing or not, it, we don't really have enough data uh, to evaluate. Bo Hui, do, we think, yeah. do you think we have time to yeah, let, we, we uh, was, let yeah, them we, to quickly uh, answer the questions in the chat? Yeah, we, we have time constraints and let's pick some questions. And then regarding the identification, I think uh, Long Wei has one question regarding the list. Mm -hmm. So how do they build up the list? Did they build up the, the list already? So he uh, one, he's wondering if they build up the list at the beginning of the week and then they are going to use the list over the week and then that will also affect the uh, identification. Yeah. Yeah, another based on question oh, about so I, I think Wujibo also asked a similar question regarding regarding the difference between men, male and female borrowers. And uh, mm -hmm. one explanation is that the female borrowers they they could be rational. <laughs> uh, definitely, yeah. we need why does that lead to the result? Life. Then they try to find some explanation for the result. Yeah, and also the why does about okay, the, the long-term effect. And then uh, Tracy made the comment that uh, so far there's uh, some few experiment focusing on the short-term effect of negative uh, reciprocity and uh, whether using the debt market, we can study the long-term impact. So far, I cannot collect the, find a way to, to tease out the long-term effect. Maybe you, you have some thought anyway. I think long-term effect will be really difficult. Uh, Wupo already has a thousand uh, complaints for a short-term effect <laughs> estimate. So if you are trying to estimate the long-term effect, it's going to be really difficult. Uh, what was the first question? I the first question oh yeah, you have a daily. Yeah, yeah, you just run an algorithm. Each day you generate uh, a list. 
And most of the time, if you don't finish your list, the next day we'll just move on because at the bottom of the list, those are not very uh, worthy according to their opinion. Only in rare occasions when the collector is sick, the whole list is not touched and then next day maybe they will work on it. So I think uh, on this issue, I think that uh, uh, lender is pretty uh, rational. They, they obviously, they, they try to work on those loans with the high repayment propensity. And um, also the, second, the difference between female and the male. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I think the result on the male and the female, the previous literature, the experimental literature is super clear. The uh, they, uh, retaliation, is weaker among uh, female participant subjects in their experiment. Uh, we have this uh, pretty clearly documented in the experimental literature. And the first one I cited is a science uh, paper where they, they, they show um, that overall the, the uh, negative uh, reciprocity is weaker uh, for female. And the retaliation is specifically for automaton bargaining game where they show the female players are more likely to accept a low offer. Even they offer them $30, $20, the female uh, participants have a higher propensity to accept. And that is really consistent with our evidence here where female uh, borrowers retaliate uh, less. And it, it's, uh, it, it's the opposite of nothing to lose hypothesis. If there's nothing to lose, you should uh, see a stronger effect for female. Uh, Borrowers. Okay, sounds good. And uh, probably let's wrap up uh, today's uh, webinar. And uh, also, and, uh, let's take this opportunity to thank uh, Professor Hong Junyan for the great presentation and interesting paper. And uh, thank Professor Woodpo Bhattacharya for the great discussion. And uh, thank, yeah, thank you, Woodpo, for all the uh, challenging uh, comments. We'll try to get back to you uh, in the future. And also, I would like to pass the, it to uh, Professor Bernie. Oh, no. Yeah, I would, I would like to thank uh, Bo Hui and uh, the authors and the discussions. This has been a very um, exciting learning experience. Uh, it's really fascinating. Thanks for the stimulation. Um, and also thanks to, for the audience. We are over time at 18 minutes and more than 10, and still 10, and still 90% of you are still with us. Thank you very much. Um, on December 9th, uh, we will have a paper at uh, the same time, J Japan's capital market after COVID. And the presenter will be Takio Hoshi and the discussion with uh, Chen Yingyi uh, from Tsinghua. Takio is, uh, is now the Dean at the University of, uh, University of Tokyo. I look forward to seeing you again. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah.